Spiritual and Physical Health. I. Charles S. Price. Ebook version 1.0. Chapter I. It shall be done. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Ed. 11, 6, if we are seeking healing for the body, we will seek to please God, and the scripture says that without faith it is impossible to please him. But we cannot have this faith unless we experience the joy of his indwelling presence, for it is something more than an intellectual belief in God. It is the faith of God, the faith which he imparts, the faith which radiates from his indwelling. It is the Son in us that pleases the Father. So many suffering ones focus their attention on the pain which they are suffering, rather than on their source of supply, and in so doing they hinder the healing flow of God. Our need in time of sickness and suffering may seem to be very real and, indeed, it is. But it is no more real than the eternal fact of his illimitable supply. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Phil. 419, it is not in dealing with our sickness and our symptoms that we find the deliverance for which we hunger, but it is the recognition of the riches of his grace and the consciousness of his inexhaustible supply. Our God has made the promise. Behold I make all things new. He will perfect that concerning us and, to perfect, means to bring it up to God's standard, and that standard is being complete in Christ. Nothing less than that will do. It does not mean perfection in oneself, but perfection in Christ. A sinful man, in himself, can never develop the nature of a holy God. We do not become so pure and holy in self that we develop the divine nature. It is rather that the grace of the Lord Jesus has made it possible for him to come to the least and the weakest of us and, if we are willing, we can become partakers of the divine nature. He gives it. He imparts it. It overflows our spirit, it saturates our personality, it goes over our lives like a mighty flood. So we should not look at ourselves nor our sicknesses but rather look at him, his health and his virtue. Remember again the far-reaching extent of his promise. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That is the standard by which every need of spirit, soul and body is supplied. There is no reservation there. There is no withholding. We do not have a need of body, soul or spirit but what that promise covers it and he who has so wonderfully promised is able to fulfill his promise in our obedient, surrendered lives. There are those people who have believed God although they have not seen him but have entrapped through Jesus Christ. They have come up through the door which the Savior is. They have experienced that healing flow that he pours forth into the body of his believers. These believing ones have not waited for that time of seeing the awakening in his likeness, but in the present they have believed God. Whom having not seen we love. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I pet. 1. 8. These victorious spirits have pressed through the maze of this world's affairs and the confusion of the flesh until they are continually receiving that energizing, quickening power of God for spirit, soul and body. They are finding the Lord more than sufficient for every need of life. His presence permeates into every department of the entity which they are and they not only experience the cleansing flow of Calvary, but their physical bodies are bathed in the gentle rays of the divine health which radiate from his indwelling like rays of the morning sun. God is faithful. The body may be continually attacked through the manifold results of the fall, but God has promised to make a way where there is no way. There hath no temptation, testing, taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with a temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. I pour. 1013, let those words ring within your heart. He is faithful. He is faithful. He who has promised a way of escape will also provide that way of escape. We cannot manufacture it. He provides it and, in faith, we utilize that divine provision. Faith laughs at impossibilities and cries from the reality of knowing him. It shall be done. Oh, glorious oneness with a true God. What blessing we receive when having not seen, we have believed. Unbelieving, we press through symptoms, trials, pains and perplexities. Not because of any virtue from ourself, but because we have believed him. When we believe him we have no confidence in the flesh. The more we behold his glorious ability, the more we are convinced of our inability. We cannot, but he can. No longer do we lean on self, but we lean on him. No matter how dark the night, the redeemed spirit sings. He is able. No matter how intense the suffering, we know that he is able. No matter how great the perplexity, we are sure that he is able. We sing triumphantly, victoriously, because we can do no other when we are conscious of his presence. Can darkness stand in the presence of the light? When he is near, we are convinced that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. 
For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. E. 10. 1. 12. Sing in triumph through every adversity, perplexity and pain, he is able. And we who love him are so persuaded. How enlightening are the words that Jesus spoke to the sufferers when he was here among men. Believest thou that I am able to do these things? Our exultant spirits cry, Yes, Lord, thou art able. Thou, and thou alone. Believest thou, beloved, that these words are living and vital? Believest thou that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? It is not the reward that we receive at the end of this age. It is not waiting until some heaven opens up its gates to receive us. It is not in some far distant future to which we look through the windows of the promise, but it is here and now. It is today. God is not only the God of our tomorrows, he is the God of our todays. He daily loadeth us with benefits. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. P.S. 68.19 He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And the reward is not reserved for the future alone, it is imparted and infused here and now. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Today, we should listen to the divine pleading and give heed to the divine call. Not as the fathers did when they hardened their hearts and refused to listen to the voice that was calling them, but wandered around in an unnecessary wilderness for forty years. Oh, what grief we unnecessarily carry. Oh, what loads we bear. All because we do not realize that the things that we have been anticipating in our tomorrows, God, in his love and grace and mercy, would impart to us today. Not only in the future, but in the here and now are we accepted in the beloved, and that acceptance embraces every needy part of us, body, soul and spirit. Fullness of joy. David in Psalm 16, 8, 11 says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. There are, not will be. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. How wonderfully does the Spirit reveal the far-reaching significance of those words, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. As Christ was raised up by the quickening power of God and continually manifested to the incredulous world the glory and power and virtue invested in him by the Father, so he is pleading with us, to draw nigh, with full assurance, counting all things but lost that we might win Christ. Let us draw near, with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Heb. 10.22 In days of old the Master stood, with outstretched arms and broken heart, crying to the people of Jerusalem, who insisted upon going about their own, preconceived ways and following out their daily pursuits. They were burdened and they were heavy laden, they were sorrowful and sinful and sick, in body and soul. They must have looked to him like the majority of people in this war-torn, weary world look on the streets of every city in which dwell men. From the depths of his innermost being, he cried, Come unto me and I will give you rest. That was the condition that they come to him. They were to find that rest in him. How often would he have gathered them to him, but they would not. He wanted them to hide under the shadow of the Almighty. He wanted to take their broken bodies and give them his strength and his healing. He wanted to take their sins and give them his salvation. He wanted to take their impurities and give them his holiness. He wanted to be all to them that they needed and he would have been, had they only listened to his plea and accepted his invitation of grace. He knew that all of them would be accepted by the Father in him. But still they went their own willful and sinful ways. The way to God is through Christ and the way to Christ is through faith and the way to faith is through surrender of our will to God's will. We draw near to God through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, 8, Committing we must not stumble, because the answer does not always come our way. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Though sometimes he causes us to tarry for a little while, it is always for our good. It is for the development of those things in us that will cause us to draw near and closer to his precious, wounded side. He knows our frame, he understands our human frailties. He is fully conscious of the pain we bear and the suffering we endure. He knows, for he wore it in his own body to the tree. It pleases him when in spite of symptoms we trust him, and in spite of the fact that the way may be temporarily dark, we have confidence that the light will shine through. The skies will be riven, the dark clouds will part asunder. God will vindicate his word. The sun will manifest the answer to our prayers and work in us the fulfillment of his own promises. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. 
For ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Heb. 1035, 39, in Isaiah 42, 3, we read, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench, he shall bring forth judgment unto truth. So, if perchance, you find yourself filled with the glory of God, and you are made to feel the nearness of his divine presence, thank him. Praise him. Treasure it as the most priceless gift that time affords us to know. If, perchance, you have followed afar off, thank God that at least your eyes have desired to see him. If, indeed, there is only a trickle of faith a cloud the size of a man's hand only, and that a distance away, thank God! Praise him for that! The man and his servant who climbed up the steeps of Carmel knew what the promises were. In spite of the antagonism of a king and his entire country, they believed God. In spite of the unbelief of the entrenched ecclesiastical system, they believed God. It meant something for Elijah to believe God in that day. Believing God not only brought the fire that consumed the sacrifice, but it later brought the rain that ended the long period of famine and made the desert rejoice and blossom as a rose. After him had answered the cry of the prophet on the summit of Carmel, there was still no sign of rain. But Elijah believed God. Oh, what victories are when men believe God. They do not believe the cloudless skies, they believe God. They do not believe the symptoms which exist and the conditions which surround them. They believe God. So, over and over again, Elijah's servant went out to the end of the promontory and looked out over the sea. Then it came. Only the size of a man's hand, but later it filled all the skies and the drenching rain came. The God of heaven had answered and he asked the one who never fails. So if you see the cloud the size of a man's hand, thank God for that and do not upbraid yourself for him because the rain clouds do not instantly appear. Saw ye not the cloud arise, little as a human hand? Now it spreads over all the skies, hangs over all the thirsty land. Lo, the promise of a shower. Drops already from above, but the Lord will shortly pour. All the fullness of his love. He has prescribed for this very hour for you and for me. Keep on looking up, beloved. Look up above the degree of your faith, up above the thorns and the thistles, yes, look up, and be not afraid. The clouds are parting. The skies are being rent asunder. What he has promised you will also perform. You will not fail. Through the rift, in the dark, we shall see in the vision that meets our gaze something of the king in all his virtue and his beauty. Something of his radiant presence that has been flowing from the throne ever since time was. Something that will make our hearts pant after more of its flowing grace, even as the heart panteth after the water brooks. Even so will our souls and our spirits long and yearn for the eternal God. Four things. There are four things our father would have us remember. First, he calleth for thee. As in the days of Martha and Mary and the sorrow, filled home at little Bethany, Jesus came in all the power of his lovely presence to lift them out of their despondency and to dry their eyes and wipe their tears away. It was after she had met Jesus face to face that Martha sought out her sister and said, The Master is come and calleth for thee. That is the message we would give you now. The Master is come and calleth for thee. Secondly, his love is upon thee. In spite of your weakness, ye, even transgression, his love is upon thee. No matter how deep the night through which you are passing, his love still overshadows and his heart still yearns. His love, his unfailing hand, like his very nature, knows no end. How the burdens lift when we begin to realize that he loves us. It is because of that love divine, all loves excelling, that we are permitted to drink of the fountains of his eternal supply just as he gave the woman to drink by Samaria's wayside well. Thirdly, his power is flowing out and into thee. Take it. Drink it. You cannot drink such an ocean dry. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. When we have tried the last vestige of human power, when we have utilized the best and the greatest of human might, be it of body or of brain, we come to the end of self, and realize our own helplessness. Then the river flows from beneath the throne. Then the waters of redeeming love and of his unfathomable spirit, begin to flow. First, to the ankles, then to the knees, then to the loins, and, behold, ere long, we have waters to swim in. Drink. 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 For you can never drink that river dry. And, for, he is sufficient for thee. One of all, ask the question, who is sufficient for these things? There is only one answer. He is. More than sufficient. We must not upbraid ourselves because of our lack of sufficiency. We must not fasten our eyes upon our shortcomings, but we must gaze upon the one who has been lifted up. He alone is sufficient. There was not life for a lifetime of service. There was life for a look. There is life and health and strength and healing at this moment for thee. He is sufficient. He and he alone. I am. 
when in the days of old he came walking in the middle of the night toward his affrighted disciples, utilizing the sidewalks of the sea, they were filled with fear. They thought they had seen a spirit. He was doing as he always does, a new and unusual thing. The night could not hold him back. The storm could not detain him. They needed him until the mean must needs go. At the moment of their crying out in fear, his voice sounded over the waves. I am. Be not afraid. G.R. I am. He still is the great I am. We must not say he was then or he is now, or he will be in the future. We cannot separate him from time, for he always is. He is still I am. He is approaching your boat. He is coming to you, walking upon the sea. He has heard your cry and he does not upbraid. He knows your fears, but he does not condemn. Rather does he speak, with that wonderful voice of assurance, and fear, cannot live when Jesus speaks his message of assurance to your heart. Hear him, for he is speaking now within. It is I I am. Be not afraid.